everyone and welcome back to the end of the week with the damage report. We're gonna do it classic style, that, that won't make any sense yet. But in a month, you'll look back and think of this as being done classic style. And by classic style, I mean, we're not gonna take everything too, too seriously. And we're gonna have Brett Ehrlich. Brett, how's it going? It's fine, I do wanna say this morning, um, I, I had the biggest panic I've had in a long time. Because I definitely need to stop producing shows from the shower. Um, today, uh, when you're in the shower and you're using your phone, I was like, all right, I'm just gonna send this link. There's little splashy splashies that come out all over the place and start pushing buttons on your phone. And as I was slacking with our dear friends, Sophie and Marissa, mm -hmm. the splashy splashies started a, a video oh call. <laughs> Oh, no, and no, I no, no, immediately no. saw it. I'm like, stop, 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 throw it, go this way, this way. Oh my God, this and is so like I, Final Destination, but more <sighs> horrific. So I almost started the day off with a litigation. Uh, exactly, um, with, well, which that, I would have lost. Turns out, yeah, and then, then we're not gonna have Brett for the next four Fridays because he did what you'd expect. <laughs> um, anyway, I I'm glad I, you I wanna say the closest I've ever come to something like that was the flip side when Ricky Strom called me on a video call and I was in the shower. I watched TV, I put my phone sideways on a little hook and I watched TV and it was Ricky Strom and I was like, I might answer this. <laughs> you watch TV <laughs> while in the shower? Yeah. How long have you great. taken in there? I mean, I'll occasionally put on a podcast or something, but the video is weird. Anyway, um, Brett, thank you for being here. I'm slightly less excited than I was, but thank you for being here. Um, apologies in advance to everyone for what is going to be an even more steady decline in the quality of this show. Because the issue is that I am going to be taking a few days off. Not soon, by the way, like I'm here all next week, but I can already feel it, Brett. How early are you allowed to have senioritis? So <laughs> good. I feel that break coming. I was trying to figure out. I need it. Oh, without asking you what you were up to, I was mm -hmm. like, "Well, that must be." I Google. I looked up every conceivable convention. Now that you're vaccinated, <laughs> I was like, "There are no conventions that week." I don't no, know what the yet. hell he could be doing, but he's gonna stay Kate. That's nice. Yay. Yeah, no, I'm gonna stay K. I'm gonna try to finish writing my book. It's gonna be fun. I'm going good. to eat healthy, except not. Really not, but anyway. Um, okay, Brett, well, uh, we've got a lot we're gonna be talking about everyone. Through the course of this hour, we are gonna be talking about a little bit of the updates of what's going on in Israel, Palestine. Uh, the Republican Party has a new leader, sort of, same as the old leader. Um, good news on COVID and Marjorie Green. That's it, just her and her whole thing, which now has become America's thing, and then, Garbage people of the week. We're going to um, bask in our time with Brett Ehrlich giving us garbage people. And uh, you're gonna have to stay tuned to the end of the show for that. And, and uh, before you get there, what's up? The rest of the day, you're gonna have John on the Young Turks, Francesca mm -hmm. Fiorentini on the Young Turks, both presenting ours. Mike Figueredo from the Humanist Report, in addition mm -hmm. to Jake Uger. And Brian Tyler Cohen is gonna be on second hour and post game today. Makes uh, you know videos on the internets, awesome. like the rest of us. Good. And then after that, on Common Room, uh, we're gonna be having two very big things. If John, if you're interested in participating, we're gonna do games tonight. <gasps> Not a normal Common Room. We're all gonna hang out and play some games. So if you want to, at any point, John, just let us I know. Tier two and out. three, we'll have first dibs and stuff. And uh, right. don't worry, I looked it up. I asked your wife if you were busy, and as soon as she said you were, I was like, oh, let's torture him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, yeah. that's not true. And then uh, there's a big announcement that we're gonna make on Common Room tonight at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern that involves you, the viewer. Huge announcement, yet another thing that even John doesn't know about. I to have get no you idea. on with us, awesome. it's a huge announcement, so, so be sure to join. Well, uh, that sounds awesome, and I don't know anything about literally anything. Um, but that said, there are a few things that I know a little bit about, and we're gonna talk about those things. Um, oh, please hit the like button, share the stream, and you can send us messages as we go through. And we will do our best to respond to your questions, comments, concerns, all of that. If any one of you are not vaccinated, I don't think there's anyone who's left unvaccinated, but you're getting vaccinated, feel free to let us know. And with that, 
Let's jump into the news. The situation in Palestine is getting even worse. Over the night, there was another massive series of bombings. We now have something like a ground invasion of tanks and soldiers. And here in the US, we have effectively like no leadership. We have some good people that we're gonna spotlight. And then we have people in actual positions of power who are largely just throwing their hands up and saying, what will be, will be. US President Joe Biden said just yesterday that he doesn't believe that Israel's onslaught against the besieged Gaza Strip this week has been a significant overreaction. Remarks that came shortly before the Israeli military escalated its assault on the densely populated territory with air and artillery attacks involving nearly 200 warplanes, tanks and brigades of ground troops. Just hours after his comments, in fact, Israel added three more brigades of ground troops to its offensive in Gaza. According to Gaza's health ministry, as of earlier today, God only knows now, 119 people have been killed, including 31 children, and 830 have been wounded by the Israeli assault thus far. In Israel, seven people have been killed, including a six year old boy and a soldier. Or put it in non numeric terms, not a significant overreaction. Certainly not a surprising overreaction at the very least, but. Look, this is, you know, at least this is consistent from Biden. This is effectively what he has said earlier this week. It's consistent with his reaction to these sorts of incidents in the past. And it is very much in step with comments coming from the leadership of both parties, Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell. This is effectively for those who are in power, this is the line that they've been taken. They can defend themselves, they can define defending themselves however they want. And whatever they do, it will not be an overreaction. Brett, what are your thoughts? We have already gotten so far away from the crazy thing. The you crazy mean like what started it. Well, it started it. Mm -hmm. the, Benjamin Netanyahu, after his inability to form a government, needs a government to form, and he needs to neutralize the opposition. The opposition would have utilize the support of Arabs who live in Israel. And to neutralize that, Benjamin Netanyahu kicked a bunch of people out of their homes and threw concussion grenades into a mosque. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of a was don't think it was a significant overreaction. The question is like, what are you even reacting to? Yeah. The signet there is what is a significant overreaction? In this situation, and I know about all the nuances in the history of Israel. It is very, I have a lot of thoughts about it that don't jibe with a lot of the tiles that I see people repost on their Instagram. Like many wrong tiles on your Instagram right now. But even I, like someone who disagrees, I don't know, not you, <laughs> I haven't seen your tiles. But I've seen plenty of people who are like, it's been a huge week for people who Googled Israel, Palestine, read like a paragraph and now are experts. Like that's mm -hmm. insane. And the tagline is, it's not that complicated. That tagline is generally false with Israel. But it is absolutely accurate right now. Mm -hmm. Right now, this last week, regardless of how much you Googled and read about the history of Israel, Palestine, the UK and the US and colonialism and the Ottoman Empire. Going back to who's been in charge of that land for millennia. Right now, it's what I just said. Mm -hmm. It's Benjamin Netanyahu unafraid to start a war because it'll help him keep power. Yeah. And that's it. And what's most shocking and insane are two things. One, that um, that that. Joe Biden is still like, and then we've gotten so far from that very simple thing. And two, to the credit of people in Congress, the people in Congress are actually talking about it now. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, none of the leadership. Well, it's not, you're totally right. The leadership, and I mean Democrat and Republican, has been awful and they have not engaged in any way with anything accurate about why we're where we are. And I'm, I'm not expecting you know them to contextualize the last 75 years or whatever, but like they literally will not even acknowledge what happened this weekend. Yeah. Um, if you were to ask Biden, uh, what, overreaction to what? Oh, Hamas firing rockets. That's it. Hamas fired rockets, and now they're responding. That's it. Like our mem, we have political goldfish memories when it comes uh, to the current conflict. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic. 
or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un*** the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. While the president's commentary... Uh, on the situation in Israel and Palestine has been just the worst. Uh, there are people, as Brett has been pointing out, uh, who've been giving um, speeches that combine both empathy and a knowledge and context uh, that I find quite useful in this circumstance. So we want to spotlight a few of those. And we want to start off with Representative Rashida Tlaib. Here's what she had to say. I am a reminder to colleagues that Palestinians do indeed exist, that we are human, that we are allowed to dream. We are mothers daughters, granddaughters, we are justice seekers and are unapologetically about our fight against oppressions of all forms. And colleagues, Palestinians aren't going anywhere no matter how much money you send to Israel's apartheid government. If we are good, are to make good on our promises to support equal human rights for all, it is our duty to end the apartheid system that for decades has subjected Palestinians to inhumane treatment and racism. So look, I'm glad that she's uh, both talking about her own experience and also shedding light on what the regular, like all the conversation is about Hamas fighters. But Hamas fighters are not the vast majority of those who are being killed. It is people like in the picture uh, that Representative Tlaib was showing. And, and I speculated yesterday, I think on the pre-show that one of the reasons why I feel like the conversation this time around has been slightly different is that thanks to social media and thanks to a slightly larger um, willingness in mainstream media like CNN and MSNBC to actually speak to Palestinians, to talk about their experience, to show photos and videos of them cowering as bombs drop down, that you can see the buildings being destroyed in real time. It is more difficult to just you know, throw your hands up on both sides it to accept the official statements from either the government or the military. Like it is difficult to deny the humanity of people that you have to see, you have to see their humanity. Maybe I'm being overly optimistic, Brett, but I feel like there there is a more of a recognition of what's actually happening and who it's happening to here than in past cycles like this that we've covered. Absolutely, it's, it's that there's people who are willing to accept that. And, and to the credit of the voters in America, they've elected folks, new folks with new kinds of experience who can be there. And, and that beginning, that first thing that she said, it's like Palestinians exist and I'm one and I'm here. And I've shown you photos of my grandmother who's back home. Yeah, and it just doesn't, it is something that a lot of us agree with that people who seek power um, will do crazy things to keep and attain it um, and vice versa. And um, when it comes to Hamas and when it comes to Benjamin Netanyahu, that applies. But what it doesn't apply to is like people just sitting in their homes, just having a day. Yeah. Uh, when you know, I saw a video of, of some Palestinian kids and it might not have been from this round, it might have been from a previous round, but it, they were they were sitting there and making a YouTube video and rockets started hitting. Like, yep. It's some and and again, you don't have to go past what started this round to to stand up and say that's insane. Now, it is complicated, 
the things that are complicated about it are the geopolitical BS that goes into um, being the foot, the strategic foothold in a region and needing a strategic foothold in a region. Um, and yeah, yeah, we can go into the history of 1967 and 1970, you know, and then the Yom Kippur War and all of that, and like what happened immediately. But there are very real things that I think everyone brings up when their side is accused of uniformly being terrible. Yeah, is that that's not true? That's just not true, and it can't be true, and we know it. Well, look, we've got two more speeches on a show exercise, so we're gonna we're gonna play each of them, give you our brief commentary. Um, I wanted to make sure that everyone got to see some of what Representative Ilhan Omar had to say about what's currently happening with Israel and Palestine. Here is, and by the way, all of what we're going to show you, the full speeches are available online. You can go to C-SPAN's website and or YouTube. But here is a bit of what she said. Mr. Speaker, as someone who has experienced war firsthand, I have deep understanding of the suffering that comes along with it. As a child, I lived through a violent civil war that destroyed my home, ripped my family apart from each other, and killed many of my family and friends. I can still remember being just eight years old, hiding under the bed, hearing bombs go off outside my window, and wondering if we were going to be hit next. It is trauma I will never, I will live with for the rest of my life. But we must speak out truthfully and forcefully about the seed of this conflict and about what is happening today. The truth is that this is not a conflict between two states. This is not a civil war. It is a conflict where one country, funded and supported by the United States government, continues an illegal military occupation over another group of people. So uh, very important context and making sure that if we're gonna have US politicians talking about this, they should acknowledge the involvement of the US historically and even currently and even in the future after this to continue funding them. Um, and she's willing to lay it all out and be honest about it. But also she talked about her experience and think like this is a representation right in front of us of why it is good perhaps to not exclusively have a government made up of 99% white males who went to an Ivy League school, became lawyers, and then eventually served in their state legislature and then went like and became a congressman basically. Like that having people of different life experiences, even people who grew up and lived outside of the US can be very important for helping the incredibly insular and often prone to xenophobic American population understand what other people's experiences are actually like. And to be able to comment on situations like what we're seeing right now. What do you think, Brett? Yeah, I mean, that's, I agree with that sentiment. Like, I've talked to people who have similar experience. I know a guy who's Iranian, and when he was a kid, he was talking and fine, and then a rocket hit his house, and he didn't talk for five years. Jesus. Like, and he carries that around with him, and you see him, and he's like, he's like really happy go lucky guy, but he's like, you know, has a scar down the side of his head, and he's just like, it's crazy. That he's able to have just like be a fun loving dude after that. <laughs> I know. I, I I can't imagine. And meanwhile, contra you know, uh counter whatever. I'm stuffy today. But um, you know, juxtapose that to people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who are pretending that they're the true victims of the Israel Palestine conflict. I like that's I, don't, I didn't even see that. I don't I like I'm well, I in guess general, I'm not shocked that she would try, but yeah. Well, it, I, there's, there's no, but that, that prevailing sentiment from her that this is the real deal, that she knows about it to the very least, that she's the one who goes out there and saying these Hamas Gaza bombers, without remembering the beginning of the sentence, the, the, yeah. the setup to it, like this, this interaction, this escalation over the last few days, is purely political. It has nothing to do with who attacked who. It has nothing to do with like the history of Gaza and who has ruled over it for millennia. Yeah. It simply has to do with Benjamin Netanyahu trying to keep power. Yeah. That is it. Tie a bow around it. It's done. And and 
the the people who run America's purse strings are just like, Ugh, we made this decision a while ago. And that's another theme of it, right? Another theme is, well, this has been happening. So if we change it in any material way, we're gonna have to deal with like real feelings and real consequences, and they don't wanna do that. So a lot of the Americans in power right now are just looking around being like, I hope it doesn't escalate too much. It's in our best interest, like it always has been for Americans intervening in other countries. It's just to be like, I just want a solid setup that benefits me. I hope not too many people die, but I just want to be able to pick up the phone and call whoever is in charge of a country at any given moment and have them like me. And the countries who America needs the most know that about it. And they're playing the real politics. And as we look back on like the politics in America and people arguing blah, blah, blah. It, it, it goes nowhere near what is happening here. But I just remind people, the thing we were afraid about with Trump going into an election is that he would start a war to keep people behind him because folks rally around their leader during a time of war. That so thing we we're concept. afraid about. That's it's, exactly what's happened. Netanyahu's just like, mm, it's not the first time. Yeah. In this particular country with this particular politician. Yeah. yeah. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had this to say about what's happening in Palestine. We have to have the courage to name our contributions. And sometimes I can't help but wonder if the reason we don't do that, if we're scared to stand up to the incarceration of children in Palestine, is because maybe it'll force us to, to confront the incarceration of children here on our border. If by standing up to the injustices there, it will prompt us to stand up to the injustices here. We have a responsibility. And if we have historically said and committed to a role as an honest broker, then we must fulfill that role. That means we have to be honest with ourselves, with, with what our aid supports. We have to be honest and ask ourselves questions like why we are using our veto power and the UN Security Council in, in preventing statements from being released about concerns for this violence alike. The president and many other figures this week stated that Israel has a right to self-defense and this is a sentiment that is echoed across this body. But do Palestinians have a right to survive? Yeah. She's right, look, um, for regular, like to the extent that there even are regular Americans that wholly agree with the the line that, that she's talking about there that we've heard from uh, you know, leaders in, in both parties. Um, I don't know how much they think about you know, what we allow over there and how it ties into uh, our policies at the border here. But I do think that for some of the politicians, the idea that States can do what they want. That we have to ignore the possible, um, you know, effect that either religious bigotry on the one hand or racism on the other hand might have, and uh, what sorts of policies we allow in certain contexts that we would never stand for in others. Um, I think that that is definitely something we need to question uh, for our politicians. Um, and look, just overall, I, I'm so glad that they're there to provide this perspective. This perspective that, by the way, they're not. You know, alone in, in providing, we're not going to show everything. But you know, Representative Pocan has had good things to say, and obviously Bernie's good on this issue and all of that. But they're willing to call out not just, you know, Trump and whatever. Like, imagine if this were happening a year ago. But they are they are trying to get Biden to act right on this issue and to be more reflective of where the bulk of the Democratic Party and certainly Democratic voters stand, where their values stand on these issues. And the idea that, that they've been pitched as like our biggest enemies or even specifically AOC. So AOC was really critical of Andrew Yang's comments earlier this week. And Glenn Greenwald wrote like a whole blog post about how she was running defense for Nancy Pelosi by making this about Andrew Yang. Well, now she is and has been calling out Biden all week. Just like, the, we're, look, we're gonna show you later on the, the weird obsession um, of AOC uh, by people like Marjorie Green, but it is not just Marjorie Green. It is not just 
Republican elected officials that have this bizarre obsession with trying to make everything an inroads to an attack against people like AOC or Rashida Tlaib or Ilhan Omar. We don't have time, but there were great, great quote comments from people like Cori Bush and Anna Presley as well. So anyway, um, yeah, Brett, what do you think about what Representative Casa Cortez said? I mean, us taking into account our responsibility as the most powerful nation in the world, funding the most powerful, you know, funding Israel. And then taking the money and doing stuff like this, like that's bad, right? Mm-hmm. Um, other th- final thoughts, like I still can't wrap my mind around setting up a country that, it, like, aside from Judaism, Islam, any other religion, setting up a country that's just for a religion. Now, this is a heritage and everything, but I just going back, it just dri- drives me crazy when everyone says it's very simple. And I know why they're saying it's very simple. And I know it goes back to like a Michael Brooks clip, but like, it's not. It's very I, complicated. Yeah, I, I don't think that they are saying that the political history or the political solutions to the overall problem are simple. I think they're saying that but a standing of, against a continued effort that is killing civilians, that that is, I, from a values point of view, that is simple. I think we've. And I think we've done a good job of saying that that aspect is simple so far on this show today. But I and I also have said that I don't think that when you know it's so easy for the the instinct that we all have, it's so easy to humor it that everyone is a certain way. I'm just looking at specific a lot a large percentage of the the tweets I see now are. Again, it's it has to do with in order to get the change that you want and the change that's needed, folks generalize in ways that are just create a lot of misinformation and a lot of stupid, stupid opining um, based on things that are like just ahistorical. And that's frustrating for me to encounter in this, especially when it's when when folks need to focus on what just happened because that's the easiest way to to really make the change that's necessary. And that's to end Benjamin Netanyahu's control over Israel, as well as, you know, have it more and as well as like the more religious extremism and like militant Zionism that I've seen mm-hmm. in, in Israel over the last, you know, six chapters yeah. of this book. Yeah. Earlier this week, Liz Cheney was booted out and it looked like there might be a bit of a challenge to who is going to replace her. Now everybody had been saying it would be Elise Stefanik, um, but Chip Roy threw his little hat in the ring. Marjorie Green seemed to be implying that she should be considered well in the end. No, it, it was Elise Stefanik. She won 134 to 46 for Roy and then a couple of others, but it didn't really matter. So Brett, uh, she did win. And she had a press conference where she thanked the voters, although presumably not the voters for Liz Cheney, as well as thanking Donald Trump. And she was asked a question about the guy whose loyalty to whom was the only reason that she was chosen for this position. And here's what she had to say. Scott. Is, is President Trump the leader of the Republican Party? I believe that voters determine the leader of the Republican Party and President Trump is the leader that they look to. Uh, I support President Trump, Uh, voters support President Trump. He is an important voice in our Republican Party and we look forward to working with him. How can you be unified so long as you have some members who support the former president and some who don't? We are unified and I look to the voters across America. Republican voters are unified in their support and their desire to work with President Trump. And we are unified as Republicans. Oh, okay. well. Look, I get that you have to be like, I said there'd be unity and there is, but you are only in that position now because they booted the past one out because she didn't agree on an important issue. She was canceled, you've taken over her slot. So Brett, it seems like, I get we're not gonna get a better answer than that, but it feels like it sort of deserves a better answer than how can there be unity when you only got your job because of the lack of unity? Or at the very least, the effort to enforce unity that doesn't actually currently exist there. I mean, it's very clear what's happened. Mm -hmm. McCarthy tried doing what Cheney kind of tried, which is they looked around and said, we kind of have to be decent, right? For a second, we have to be decent. There's some weird, weird stuff. And like, this is still DC. We still kind of have to be a little decent. And they tried that and then Mm -hmm. immediately saw blowback 
from the voters and from Trump at every step of the way. Mm-hmm. He looks around and when you're saying the potential like people to fill in that slot, um, what is she, they're definitely not gonna pick a Marjorie Taylor Greene. They're definitely not gonna pick a Matt Gates type person. They're gonna pick someone exactly like Elise Stefanik, someone who will tra- transform into being whatever they need her to be to play the role that's necessary to play at the time. Mm-hmm. And, and it's almost reassuring and like a pedigree at this point for someone like um, McCarthy, someone like McConnell who would be very happy, would pay many, many dollars to make it so that Donald Trump just disappears and that the Republican Party can be in control reliably without any of that Trump support. Mm-hmm. And so they look for someone like Stefanik, who at one point kind of tried saying, yeah, this is ridiculous what Trump is doing, right? Because well, she has this do, clip. Do you think that, so look, we, we know that they're, they are saying we're all for Trump. But we know that quite a few of them aren't doing that because they're true believers. Like some of them are, like you know, Marjorie Greene doesn't have a single fold in the surface of her brain for yeah. nuance towards that. She actually fully supports him. Others are saying they have to because they believe that they have to, but they secretly hate him or are suspicious of him. So is Elise Stefanik, the fact that she used to be critical of him and that seems to have been her honest opinion. And now she's hiding that, does that let them have their sickening loyalty and eat it too? That she is perceived by Trump to be a total loyalist and outwardly she will be, but she secretly doesn't totally like him. So maybe won't be as crazy of a wild card as someone like a Marjorie Green would be? I mean, yes. Oh, okay, good. She, she, I mean, she's she's exactly what they need right now, and they needed someone who can deliver that line that way. Someone who, you know, gets like, all right, I'll put on the big pearls and I'll put on the freaking thing and I'll stand in front of everyone and I'll say, we'll fight tooth and nail against this terrible, stupid stuff. They know they can read the report on how what messaging seems to work right now. And they'll be able to on the fly say exactly those things. They don't want the psychos in charge. They just want mm-hmm. someone who can pull off a psycho impression. Yeah, and that's Elise <laughs> Stefano. <laughs> that is true, that is you true. know, like okay. I think in, in, in Fresh Prince of Bel Air, Will's approach to when someone was about to attack him was to just like start twitching. <laughs> and that's what she did. That's what Sorry she's been doing me. ever since it was clear. Say all of them have. Mm-hmm. Everyone has started just twitching. So they're like, no, I'm crazy too, like you guys. Yeah. Um, and just leave me in power. Mm-hmm. And and to Trump's and like that is a that is something actually to be aspired to um for Folks who want a populist message in on the left. I mean, imagine if everyone just kind of came around. Now, juxtapose Elise Stefanik, who can deliver those attack lines to Nancy Pelosi, who can't. Who's like, uh, it, it, what they are uh, doing is um, Tara uh, Bull, and we mm-hmm. can't have. What? I just went to sleep. There's no yeah. attack dogs who can really deliver the attack. The way that the people in power want them to, yeah, there's not, folks who not can deliver the attack on the left. Um, the AOCs, the Ilhan Omar is like all of those folks can do it. Yeah, but it's not a message that resonates at all with uh, the folks in power to the point where they feel they need to sit up and take notice and embrace those messaging points and deliver it. Every time they do choose sure. someone, it comes off as someone so tone deaf. That they that the the game is given away. It's not a convincing enough impression for us to be like, oh, they are on our side. Are we free? Well, feeling like we might be moving closer to that because yesterday the CDC, which has been like from the point of view of people who want things to go back to normal, their advice has been disappointing over the past few months, especially as more and more people have gotten vaccinated. Well, now they said yesterday that Americans who are fully vaccinated against the coronavirus could stop wearing masks or maintaining social distance in most settings, including indoors. The clearest sign yet that the pandemic might be nearing an end in the United States. And in fact, the numbers have been going down. You can see here 14 day change in cases down 31%, 11% down in deaths. Still, I mean, the deaths are still at 780. The cases are still near 40,000. These are still not good numbers at all. I mean, they look like what, June, July of last year, but they're trending in the right direction. 
Um, and so Brett, are we gonna be able to hang out soon? Are you gonna feel comfortable? I mean, whether I'm comfortable or not in your presence has nothing to do with COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It has everything to do with the way you treat people. Oh God, okay. Thank you. you. Know? Now, okay, but. Not having to wear masks, not just outdoors. Like they they really skipped a step to indoors in most settings. Now I will say my fear is what I think a lot of people's fear is, which is that um, it's like you give this advice to the country. And I feel like a lot of the vaccinated people are gonna be like, well, oh, that I, I wanna hear that. But like, are you sure? Whereas most of the unvaccinated people who don't wanna get vaccinated are like, Yes, I cannot wear a mask and I'll just pretend that I'm vaccinated. It, it's almost better news for the villains in this story than the heroes. Right, but the heroes are vaccinated, so it works mm-hmm. out. Like that's the, True. that's the, and that's the real explanation for all of it anyway. The whole approach I've had to this since the beginning is what's the smart thing to do? We should probably do that. And the smart thing to do when you, when you compare the numbers now to the numbers in June, like the reason we were scared about the numbers in June is because we knew that something much worse was on the horizon based on mm-hmm. the behavior of the numbers in June. And we knew sure. that it would be a long time before we had a vaccine that would be effective. That's what was scary about those numbers. Now where these numbers lie on the and and the trend in cases overall, that's a good thing. And One of the reasons we said before a vaccine that everyone should wear masks in all possible scenarios is we don't like a lot of folks are misre. It's it's the smart thing to do. A lot of folks are misrepresenting stuff, but at the end of the day, we need to stand with the businesses who who decide that they're going to enforce the mask rule, and the cities that are like put the masks on because we just need to be careful right now, as careful as possible. Um, Yeah, but now knowing that you're if you're vaccinated, these things are safe. It takes the burden off of you and the worry off you, especially if you have the Pfizer vaccine that's something like 95% effective against reinfection. And if you are reinfected, you do not get as sick as you would have had you not had that virus or that vaccine. Now, it doesn't matter as much what the other people do. Now, Fauci went on with uh, Tapper and basically said, you're just gonna have to trust people. Uh, Uh. And you're and and the truth <laughs> is, and I disagree with economy. Fauci. If you are vaccinated, it takes the burden off you having to trust people. And if we were, I, I do believe that if we went into some kind of like show me your papers everywhere around the world, like I don't want America to be a show me your papers state. Sure. Uh, at the mall, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Um. Yeah. Look. There is the possibility that with the new announcement about not having to wear masks indoors, that it, that it could cause some problems. That is definitely a possibility. Uh, but an important part of the story that I want you to bear in mind is that while the CDC has said that you cannot wear your mask, that does not override state, local, or individual business requirements that you wear it. Like, like, and by the way, that is not going to stop a million Panera Karen videos from being generated from people who don't understand that distinction. They're like. Well, no, the Dr. Fauci said I could. No, you still Target gets to say if you get to wear if you have to wear a mask or not. And you know what Michigan does too, I guess. Um, but at least in theory, we're moving towards the the time when those might start to be weakened. We'll see. We'll see. I don't even know what TYT's next couple of months are going to look like, let alone Walmart or whatever. But um, I think that this is going to be reassuring to a lot of people. I want to show you this chart showing you. Uh, th- this is just, I think it's a great visualization of what your potential summer could be like if you get vaccinated. Here is the choosing safer activities chart. There's a lot of different activities, and there is a range from safest to less safe. If you're not vaccinated, you're gonna you're gonna get in a lot of trouble. You're gonna have a lot of problems. But if you're vaccinated, you can do all of it. You can walk, run, wheelchair roll, or bike outdoors, all the way to participating in an indoor high intensity exercise class. That is awesome. Krav Maga, it's coming again. Um, you can do all that stuff, and. Now, what I worry about is a couple of things. One is going to pop up in my garbage people. But now that the CDC is saying this, there's even more criticism coming, not at the people who haven't worn masks, would never wear a mask, but at the people who are. It's not new, Biden has been criticized for months and months for wearing a mask. 
Um, but he did have something to say to those who feel like they might start to get attacked if they continue to wear one. Here's what he had to say. So all of us, let's be patient. Be patient with one another. You know, some may say, just feel more comfortable continuing to wear a mask. They may feel that way. So if you're someone with a mask, you see them, please treat them with kindness and respect. We've had too much conflict, too much bitterness, too much anger, too much politicization of this issue about wearing masks. Let's put it to rest. Let's remember we're all Americans. Let's remember that we are all in this together. It's like the most Biden quote ever. And that that guy is the crazy Chinese socialist communist trying to destroy America. He's just like, come on, everyone. Let's just, just everyone stop yelling. Have a Werther's original. It's all gonna be good. And they pitch him as an insane radical. But anyway, yeah. uh, that is good news. And Brett, I look forward to playing Elder Chore indoors with you in the near future. It'd be nice as long as you let me win. I guess it's a collaborative that's game, a, so we it's all a collaborative win. Collaborative game. <laughs> it is. Um, that's anyway. what I like about it, actually. Mm -hmm, exactly, exactly. No, no stress. So earlier this week, Marjorie Green once again accosted Representative Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, trying to get her to debate her or look at her. So I don't know. It was it was weird and it was aggressive and it shouldn't happen, uh, but it did. And in response to that. AOC has put out a couple of comments. She said at one point that Green is a belligerent person that's not in control of themselves, which I think is actually her Twitter bio. But anyway, she also said, I used to work as a bartender, and these are the kinds of people that I threw out of bars all the time. She also, by the way, talked not just about Green, but about Ted Yoho, who called her an effing bitch. It's weird that I can say that part, but not the first part after talking with her. To that comment, Marjorie Green had a witty comeback. Saying, AOC, you've never thrown anyone out of a bar. You're too scared to talk to anyone. You're too weak and afraid to debate me and your own socialist policy that would plunge your own constituents into poverty. You only know how to hide and play victim. Marjorie Green has spent all week implying that she is the biggest victim in the world because AOC won't make a YouTube video with her, but it's AOC. Anyway, um, now to that, AOC was uh, asked some questions uh, earlier today while she was walking to the Capitol. And here's what she had to say about her stalker. It um, seems as though she had been posting some videos. I mean, this is a woman that's deeply unwell um, and clearly needs some help. Um, I, you know, I, and her kind of fixation has lasted for several years now. Um, you know, it's at this point. I think the 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 depth of that unwellness uh, has raised concerns for other members. Let's keep discussing this, but it's it's not a thing, you know. And so I'm I'm concerned about her perceptions of reality. Her also being concerned about her perceptions of reality. That is the understatement of the year. And we've got some feedback going on in the background. I don't know what's happening with that video if we cut that off. Anyway, Brett, uh, there is more, um, but what are your thoughts? Uh, I think it's amazing. I hadn't seen that little bit where AOC says to them, uh, she's unwell. And she mm -hmm. is, she's obsessed. She's lost her mind. And um, when it comes down to it, that person is in Congress. And also, not just anyone in Congress. She's someone in Congress who her colleagues have basically kicked her off of all her committee posts. Mm -hmm. Like she's she she is going after kids in the streets. She there's a new video that emerged from that has since been deleted because she knew how incriminating it was from 2019 where Marjorie Taylor Greene is walking through the halls of Congress. Essentially, oh, we're, gonna, we're gonna get to that. Okay, we're gonna get good. To that a little bit later on. Yeah. But she, she's unhinged. Marjorie Taylor Greene is unhinged, and of course she is, and she's proudly that. Part of that is how she got elected in the first place. And listen, when it comes to the way people behave in Congress, a lot of us look at the way they've behaved since the dawn of time, perceivedly, but it hasn't always been this way. But they look at the way they behave in the halls of Congress, and they're talking in a different language. That our representatives, the way they speak is not representative of us. Mm -hmm. but. Something that should be representative of us is at least some kind of mutual understanding and respect and and uh, 
competence and being grounded in reality that our representatives need to be able to at least pass a very low bar of that um, Marjorie Taylor Greene is has turned into like the bar is just barely off the ground. But Marjorie Taylor Greene yeah. has turned into this sludge that she's very obviously made of to still somehow manage to be below that bar. Yeah, the, the, the system should be able to weed out someone like her. Like like people were sort of freaked out that Laura Loomer was running for Congress. Uh, Marjorie Greene's crazier than Laura Loomer. I, like, I, I think that's pretty clear. They had basically the same career, but she slipped through because she had some money or whatever. Anyway, uh, very classy comments from AOC about, cuz she's gotta be worried that this, this is a crazy person who uh, loves hating things and guns. Those are the two things that she loves. Um, anyway, AOC also had this to say, this isn't even about how I feel. It's that I refuse to allow young women, people of color, people who are standing up for what they believe to see this kind of intimidation attempts by a person who supported white supremacists and our nation's capital. And that support is actually even more direct than she's implying there, which we will get to in a little bit. Now that said, and this really goes to the victim thing. Green wasn't just freaking out on AOC. She was freaking out all over the place about AOC. So I'm gonna run you run you through a little bit of what happened there. So Congresswoman Green, and I hate that I still have to say that, told the Washington Post Jacqueline Almani that Representative Ocasio-Cortez can't call me a bully because I'm trying to talk with her about policy that will change our economy. What she is is a coward and a fraud and a fake. Sahil Kapoor responded, she's describing the behavior that you exhibited. To which Green said, this behavior you're exhibiting is exactly the same type of behavior. So AOC was angry that Green Green was following her through Congress, shouting at her. A reporter asked Green about that, and Green said, Nuh-uh, that's what you're doing. But Green wanted to talk to the media. Like she, that's what she did. There's more though. She says, talking to her, she says, screaming. You know what screaming is? Screaming is what people do when rockets are fired at them, like Hamas terrorists are firing into Israel. That's what people do. They scream when that happens. I was talking to AOC saying, you need to debate me about the Green New Deal. Ever since January 6th, they can't even treat us with respect, and we were victims too. But she doesn't even think that it was a serious thing. She thinks it's nothing, but she's the victim. We didn't cause it. All these lies they say on and on and on. They need to be civil. None of them. Are civil to me. And she attacked the reporters more. Like she just kept attacking the reporters for the things that she did. Anyway, she's a congressperson. She is a congressperson. She can't go to the committee here rooms or anything like that, but still technically a congressperson. One skill. There's there's a skill that I didn't realize was necess was one of the prerequisites for being a congressperson. Maybe not a prerequisite, but there's a certain skill that that used to make it less likely you'd be a congressperson. But now it makes it more likely and that skill is being that? infuriating. <laughs> Just generally infuriating and, and it's true. Social media has the, the way algorithms have incentivized people to be. You, they raise up the folks that are um, really infuriating and uh, are just as infuriating as you, right? Yeah. So she has been that person who gets on TV and people, and then add to it, the more she does that, the more she surfaced, the more name recognition she gets, the more likely yeah. that she'll be elected to Congress because that is Probably. so valuable. Probably one of the, I'd say it's the most important thing when you're running for Congress is that people know your name, even if they yeah. don't know who you are. And if they see it, they're more likely to vote for you and and all of this feeds into having people like Marjorie Taylor Greene in the halls of Congress going ah! As crazy as the stuff that Marjorie Greene did this week when it comes to AOC, it turns out that back in 2019, she was even crazier. So we're gonna show you some deranged video of when this at that point candidate and crazy right wing YouTuber um, went to her office and like creepily cornered her, I guess, in the office. So here is here is the first of Marjorie Green in the Capitol. You want to talk to Crazy Ocasio, you come to this little thing and you open it up and you whisper confession into her. Session. This is confession. <laughs> 
This is this is Ocasio confession right there. What? Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. I'm an American citizen. I pay your salary through the taxes that you collect from me through the IRS because I'm a tax-paying citizen of the United States. I'm a woman, I'm a female business owner, and I'm proud to be an American woman. And you need to get rid of your diaper and come out and be able to talk to the American citizens instead of us having to use a flap, a little flap. It's kind of like hers. It's kind Sad. Of She's like, she keeps flapping her gums. This oh, is like, this flappy, is, flappy. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, each this, one of this, is, this is like child games. This is, this is child games. session. Ugh. God, that laugh. That's going to haunt my dreams. Um, at some point, my little paper boat is going to go down the water and into the sewer, and then I'm going to see that face when I go to recover it. Anyway, um, yeah, that was like child games. Um, little flappy flappy, so sad. Yeah, that whole trip that you took to a cost, she's not even in the office, is very sad and very creepy, but really fast. I wanna, I wanna play a second part, cause she's not alone. You can see there, she's got two of her friends. So here is the next bit. <laughs> Hello there. Hello, hashtag, where's AOC? <laughs> I hear you in there. This is creepy. It's, it's hide and seek. This is, this is, Huh? Hide and seek. It's hide and seek. Tag, you're it. Guess what? You can't stay in there forever. Can you come out and play? <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> okay, so Brett, I think the only thing that was lacking was uh, beer bottles on each finger clinking together. They were saying that the the other people were creepy. They were saying that's creepy, not the Come out that you're whispering into a mail slot. Yeah. Hi, other people are crazy. Other people, <laughs> not me. I'm the same one. Good. Hi. Anyone in there? <laughs> bing, bing, bing. Insanity. I love it. So this is there's a I don't know if anyone's seen the Dana Carvey show. There was an old sketch show that Dana Carvey had for like five minutes in the 90s and it mm-hmm. had uh, I think Dave Chappelle was a writer, Stephen Colbert, Carell, they were all on it. And there was this one sketch called Stupid Pranksters where they would go up to a drive through, be like, they'd like order the food. I want a Big Mac and fries. <laughs> and then they'd be like, all right, that's $10 <laughs> at the next window. They'd go pay for the food <laughs> and then drive off without getting the food. <laughs> be like, we pranked you. That's Creepy. what this is. These are stupid pranksters. These are the people who are like, I'm going to expose how insane and stupid this other person is by getting down on my knees and screaming through a mail slot while the video evidence of this act is me like face pressing the lens, (laughs) like Blair witching the lens. You're crazy. Yeah. This does and not look, make you look good, and the people it makes you look good to. I mean, I guess if she can, if she can appeal to fifty percent of the folks in her area, I mean, she can represent those folks if they actually believe in it. But like most things that happen in Congress, she's finding a way to overrepresent folks that aren't that that shouldn't be that powerful. Yeah, yeah. I uh, look. One of the guys in that group, I don't know if it was the one who was saying that or if it was the other, uh, he took part in the Capitol riot. So yeah. in 2019, he was stalking AOC when he was allowed to. And then, he, like, what, what would he have done? What would he have done if he'd run into AOC on the 6th? But she has no connection to those people. She was the victim. She just finished saying that a little bit earlier, that she was a victim too that day from people like the ones she was hanging out with. And so, look, maybe, maybe nothing will ever happen. But that seems like the sort of crazies that eventually might do something. And I, I am very worried about like the, the like having people like that to just freely stalk Congress people. And, and AOC is not the first that she's been going after. Right after that, she was um, she ran to uh, Maxine Waters' office. She was delivering some petition calling for Pelosi to be impeached. And executed for executed, treason, yeah. like she was there for politicians' blood, basically. Um, she was like, and and by the way, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez had already been a congressperson for like two years at that point. You can't pronounce her name. 
Anyway, yeah. I know that's the least crazy part of all of that, but anyway, I just I don't like her being there. I don't like that multiple representatives must be scared that she or one of her insane um, extremist friends might decide to escalate beyond just whispering threats through a mail slot and actually do something. I can't believe she's a congressperson, and for that reason, I'm just going to start calling her Marjorie Taylor Greene. Exactly. Could we throw a tater in there? Is that possible? Marjorie like Toy Store spleen. <laughs> I like it. It's the end of the week, and so it's time to take out the trash. Okay, Brett, your last garbage person of the week for a little bit. Who is it? My garbage person of the week is Congressman Andrew Clyde, who decided that the best way to characterize the January 6 riots was not to watch all the video of people being destructive and chanting hang Mike Pence and breaking windows in order to get through or basically getting shot by the Secret Service. But rather to say that it was totally normal, it was like a tour group. Here's the video. Let me be clear. There was no insurrection, and to call it an insurrection, in my opinion, is a bold-faced lie. Watching the TV footage of those who entered the Capitol and walked through Statuary Hall showed people in an orderly fashion staying between the stanchions and ropes taking videos and pictures. You know, if you didn't know the TV footage was a video from January the 6th, you would actually think it was a normal tourist visit. So good. I, what I like about it is like, uh, which in my opinion is a bald faced lie. And if I'm an expert on anything, it's <laughs> bald faced lies. The video that I chose to watch and disregarded all the rest of, uh, it seemed totally fine. It's like, it's like watching video of a bank heist where someone is breaking into the vault, but you are looking at <laughs> video of the smoking patio. Outside where nothing's happening. It's that's what it is. Like, dude, are you kidding me? And when we say that we're being gaslit by psychopaths in Congress, sociopaths to be the kindest, this is exactly what we're talking about. Also, what was he? He had like some kind of stripe across the front of his outfit. I didn't see that. It's just so weird. But yeah, that is my garbage person of yeah, the I week. I don't know, is it, is it better that, so you have the crazies, like Marjorie Green is a crazy person. You look into her eyes and you see great Cthulhu. That guy did not believe any of what he was saying. He's seen the footage, he knows exactly what happened. He was just lying. So is liar better or worse than crazy? I don't know. People in the chat are saying that's a gun holster. Maybe. I think it might be, um, I think it's actually a seatbelt. I think he's pulling that Zoom thing where he put in a background he's and he's car. driving. <laughs> but um, like, yeah. what What are you doing? This is a guy who uh, we covered on uh, TYT yesterday. This is a guy who in his, his um, con- congressional election yard signs just have giant assault, assault rifles on them. <sighs> it's insane. Well, um, and I'm so mad. Face. So I shared this on this on Happy Half Hour the other day, and I had this idea for essentially like what the tour group that this guy is talking about offers on its website. And JR's <laughs> like, they did your idea, bro. Like uh, the Colbert did it yesterday. Oh, so if you I want to see, see that. an idea I, that I had. I remember I once went to the um, the Air and Space Museum and we erected a gallows outside. It was fun. It was fun. It was anyway, awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. Love uh, those good garbage trips. person. Where Water you like garbage. go to the Natural History Museum and just set fire to the like Cro Magnon <laughs> exhibit. <laughs> I'll show um, you fire. What what I like about those museums is you don't have to use the bathroom, you just poop wherever you want. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> My garbage person of the week is going to be. You get in there, everybody. I mean, not like any individual one of you, but but other people on the internet. Um, I've given a lot of scorn to people like uh, Tucker Carlson, who've spread lies about the vaccine. But let's also not ignore the randos that are just spreading absolute dangerous BS about the vaccine. So I got a big one and a little one. Let's start with the little one. I saw this fact check on Twitter today. The ingredients of COVID-19 vaccines do not contain any magnetic materials. That was a fact check necessitated by videos showing that people's arms had become magnetic. 
or something. Not true, it's not true at all, but now millions of Americans believe that. The bigger one though is this, so there was this store that put up a post saying, we have decided that since the majority of our customers are women, and since women are most at risk for these side effects, which we'll get to. We ask that if you've been vaccinated to please order for curbside pickup or deliver for 28 days after being vaccinated. The reason according to the shop owner is that evidence is surfacing that people who have been vaccinated are quote, shedding spike proteins, which appear to be affecting women's menstrual cycles or making them infertile depending on which mommy bloggers Instagram account you're on. While medical experts say that this is isn't true, Goldberg, the shop owner said that what he's reading shows that just being around someone who's been vaccinated can cause reproductive health issues for women. And he doesn't want to endanger any of their lives. But it's not just him, a whole private school in Miami barred teachers who've been vaccinated from coming into contact with students and threatened the employment of teachers who have been vaccinated. And overall that shedding thing, conversation online has increased in the last month about that by over 1330%. It's not true, there's no science whatsoever. But it is interesting in that after complaining about how they've been discriminated against, I have to wear a mask if I want to get a sandwich, they've found a way to do the same. And that's why it's getting this pickup, Brett. You can bar people from your store because they're carrying something now. It's it's almost too perfect, really. But not only that, in order to avoid potential contamination from spike protein shedders, Mm-hmm. They're wearing masks. The well, anti mask Let's see. Let's see. Have, no, but there's been reports that they're saying, yeah. I'm going to wear a mask now when I go out in public because I, I am afraid of the spike protein sh- uh, shedders. Mm-hmm. Whatever Which, does it, honestly. God, it's one people. of those things Mark Twain said it's, and he hey, might not know. have, it might have just been, uh, you know, remember it. It's easier to fool people than convince them that they've been fooled. Yeah, that's true. And this is I guess exactly if it works. evidence of it. So I wish oh, I'd have I thought of it, it earlier. That's true. I hate it though. Uh, now, uh, those are ours. But what, who is your garbage person of the week? Well, 24,000 of you voted. And here are your top five. At number five, with 3% of the vote, you have Bob Baffert for cheating at the Kentucky Derby and crying cancel culture. Oh, yeah, he's the guy who trained the junkie, the junkie horse, according to the former most powerful man in the world. Let's see, number four, with 5% of the vote, is Elon Musk for subjecting us all to his SNL appearance. That is the pettiest inclusion ever. Number three, with 24% of the vote, is Jeff Bezos for shopping for a super yacht while his employees suffer, Jesus. Number two with 27% of the vote, the Arizona GOP for conducting a sham audit based on conspiracies. And number one with 41% of the vote, your winner and garbage person of the week, Kevin McCarthy for leading his caucus off the deep end. Some people were asking why is like Netanyahu not on there? It's not that sort of poll. It's not for the most serious stuff necessarily, but this is all bad. This is real bad. And thank you to the 24,000 of you who voted. And thank you, Brett. We're gonna miss you, buddy. Don't just thank me or whatever my hair is doing. Thank you, everyone thank you. watching, because you earn kittens. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll hold see. them and then ah! fiercely. Ah, there's two of them. There's two little kitten babies. Oh, they're shedding spike proteins. Spike protein, spike <laughs> proteins. I'm strangling them. They love it. Just hang in there, kitty. Here. Just hang in there. All right, look at them, they smell like little goats. They're so tiny. Well, unfortunately, we've got like 10 seconds left. So thank you everybody for watching. Thank you, Brett. I'm gonna be doing the first hour of the Young Turks later on today. You can definitely stay tuned for that. And then Common Rubus will be coming up later on. But until then, stay safe out there, stay sane out there, and we'll see you soon. Today sees the release of the new documentary, Us Kids, which which charts the act, activism and movement of a number of different youth activists involved with the March for Our Lives movement over the course of a couple of years. We are very lucky to be joined by both a subject of the documentary as well as its director. We're joined by David Hogg and Kim Snyder. Welcome to the Damage Report. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us on. It's great to have you here. Uh, I'd like to start with you, David. Um, yeah, obviously you've been in the thick of this thing for a couple of years now. Uh, what was it like, sort of taking a moment to take stock of, uh, you know, where you've come from? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was a lot um, to really see the film after we'd spent so many, you know, several years basically working on it um, and being part of it and everything, um, and to finally see the product of it. I think. One of the most impressive things that uh, I took away from the film, and I hope others take away from it, is how um, deeply ingrained uh, gun violence is in the United States in 
systematic injustice in racism and um, simply in general, a lack of resources that so many communities um, unfortunately have uh, have to experience on a daily basis. That isn't accidental, but oftentimes is purposeful and a product of you know that systemic racism and injustice. And I think that's part of what makes the film so powerful is it shows that this isn't something that simply um, you know, although gun laws can certainly help, there, there's a much bigger aspect that we have to address to it um, that's causing someone to pick up a gun in the first place. Um, yeah. And recognizing the humanity of the people that are affected by gun violence and that, you know, we're all student for at least in our case, we were all students or young people for the most part. Um, but also, you know, people of all ages um, from all communities that are impacted by it. Yeah. Uh, Kim, you know, I know you've you've covered this topic before uh, with your previous film, uh, Newtown. Tell me about the, what was different about the process of uh, of making us kids. I think the emotional terrain of it was really different. Newtown was um, a film that was more about adult grief and a myopic view of one community and the horrific impact on a community that that doors something like this. Um, and so it was about collective grief of a town, whereas this film was born out of traumatized youth and rage and the impetus to do something about that to make sure that uh, their friends didn't die in vain, that they were doing something to to honor them and change change the world and they did it. So for me, it's a, it's a film that uh, is filled with hope and um, just the it's really a coming of age story too. Um, you know, as David and his his colleagues traverse the country and uh, just set forth to do it to, to 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 kick off an unprecedented youth movement, one of which we haven't seen the likes of since since the Vietnam era. And David, you obviously worked as as she's saying. You were you know, going everywhere, talking with as many people as you could, and you know, uh, tragically during that time. I mean, the US couldn't go a week without a school shooting. They were happening in the background of all of the work that you and the other activists being profiled were doing. And then last year, we had this period where briefly, we got to experience something like what almost every other major country in the world does, which is that school shootings should not be a routine thing. And then a couple of months ago, they began coming back and we're seeing mass shootings and school shootings quite a bit. Um, what has that experience been like, sort of seeing this glimpse at what we could have with potentially with different policies. You know, I, I think it actually shows a lot of the problem in the way that we tell the story around gun violence in the United States. Because although it is true that you know, because not nearly as many schools were in session, um, as a result, you know, there were significantly less school shootings that were happening. Um, gun violence is actually at a really high level over the past year, one of the highest levels, uh, you know, over the past decade. Uh, and it's unfortunately because of the kind of compounding of injustices that we saw during the pandemic and uh, that continue, um, you know, even as we start to sort of come out of it with vaccines and everything. Um, and I think it, to me, it really highlighted how deeply, um, in some ways, problematic the way that we talk about gun violence in the United States is, and how how often we leave um, the conversation around gun suicide, which are two thirds of gun deaths, out of the conversation. How often, um, you know. Uh, everyday gun violence that disproportionately affects black and brown communities because of systemic injustice and racism that has created a severe lack of resources and so many of them um, you know ended up having way more gun violence than even is is usual um, during the pandemic and I you know I think it just highlights the importance of needing to focus on the aspect of those resources and telling the stories of these individuals that are involved um, because although I know that you know I'm thankful for the coverage that Parkland has gotten um, and although mass shootings are very important, the, the fact of the matter is they make up a tiny percentage of what gun violence actually looks like in the United States. And I think as a whole, the movement has a much bigger responsibility, especially the people that do get on TV like myself and others have a much bigger responsibility to um, help broaden the spotlight and not, not necessarily say these are what, or, or speak for other communities, but express the fact that this is happening in other communities that are not simply getting on the news on a daily basis. Um, yeah. So. That's really what I thought about. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, it, these, you know, like the, the the moments that sort of stand out aren't necessarily always like fully representative of what's going on day to day. But um, but you know, obviously, I and everyone else basically appreciates you using the opportunity that you have to try to to broaden that focus. 
Um, Kim, I had a question for you. Obviously, the, the subjects of the documentary are, as it is clear, generally uh, quite young, um, sort of thrust into the national spotlight. Uh, many, including you, David, have been the target of an oftentimes insane amount of right wing uh, attention and strike back. In terms of how you portray your your subjects, what goes into the documentary, what doesn't go in? Did you have any guidelines for that, considering that the subjects were obviously on the younger side? Just mutual respect that the what you see on screen is a product of years of building some, hopefully some trust and some common goals of, about the virtue of long form documentary and what it is able to do that short form news can't do. Um, and I think it's just sort of respecting certain boundaries. I mean, in general, I'm a filmmaker that believes in, um, you know, if, if somebody says, Usually, you know if someone wants to do something or not. And if you do have an idea and you put it out there and they uh, politely decline, I'm a big believer in not asking twice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was just really respectful of how, especially on the road in the summer, how um, exhausting it was and how much other media there was. And I knew that I didn't want what those other four minute things were getting at anyway. So it was sort of just, Verite um, trying to get a lot of moments of, of real stuff along the way and them just being kids and being exhausted and you know working hard and um, all of the amazing moments we got as we traveled across the country um, and trying to weave that in and then getting to know David and the others better after that time to sort of reflect in a more hindsight way, which yeah, took yeah. us you know more than two years. Yeah, David, uh, my final question for you, uh, obviously the, the work that you did for a couple of years uh, took place under uh, the Trump administration. And uh, while there were a number of different localities and states that passed a lot of different uh, new gun regulations, um, the federal government obviously had very little interest and in likelihood that anything like that would pass while Donald Trump was president. Well, now we have a new administration, uh, Biden is in and he has in his speeches indicated uh, a greater level of support for um, considering some of these things, and yet so far, not much has necessarily happened. Um, I've seen some polls indicating that public support for new gun control measures seems to have waned a little bit. Um, and we still have politicians like Marjorie Taylor Greene advertising with themselves holding assault rifles, and they don't seem to be afraid of sort of portraying themselves as gun first politicians. Um, in terms of your like, level of anticipation of something significant being done. Um, how is the reality of the Biden administration um, sort of matching up to what we might have expected a year ago? Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly think that um, part of the issue is simply that, you know, we have the filibuster and it's incredibly hard to pass laws because of that. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and in part, as a result, we were not able to pass laws, even though the vast majority of American people support protecting children and not weapons like an AR-15, support things like universal background checks and you know other common sense gun regulations. But I will say, from what the Biden administration has been able to do within their power, without you know doing, without having some kind of like overreach or something like that, I think. Um, the commitment that they've had towards uh, helping fund violence intervention programs that are use you know public health based approaches to reduce gun violence um, is really important. Um, the impact that they've had with uh, a further commitment, a doubling of gun violence uh, uh, research funding, going from twenty five million dollars to fifty million dollars, uh, may not seem like much, but you know I think it's easy for people to forget that in twenty eighteen when we started the Dickey Amendment, it really was still around and. Um, it's essentially illegal to, to study gun violence or, or study the effects, the effectiveness of gun laws in certain states. Uh, and, and with that, there was very, very little funding, especially in comparison to something like car crashes, which kills a very, you know, a similar level or number of people every year that have basically their an entire federal department, you know, NHTSA committed to studying how to prevent car crashes and um, and highway safety and everything like that. But we don't have that for something that kills just as many people, but just happens to be more controversial. So I yeah. think uh, what the administration has done is good so far. I'd like to see more. Um, but you know, given the filibuster at the moment, it's just incredibly hard to pass these laws because um, a 
our government is not necessarily representative of us, even though we like to claim that we're a representative democracy. We're, we may be, but we're not a proportional democracy mm-hmm. in terms of the actual public opinion. Yeah, very fair points. Um, finally, Kim, um, you know, David had indicated some what some of the takeaways early on that he was hoping people would um, would have from the experience of watching the documentary. Um, for you, though, for regular people, um, what would you hope that that they learn that they might not have known go, going into a, a viewing of of us kids? I think that there there's this common thing you hear that after Newtown and you know if nothing happened, nothing will. And I think there's been such a, a reliance that looking at the the federal level, and one of the hopes I see is that this youth movement, two of the big hopes is that it, it, it genuinely is inclusive. Um, and you know, bringing together a lot of young people from across all uh, stratum of gun violence communities. And it also that they're going hyper local. They're really because of what David's saying, because there is you know, certain realities to what can happen federally, looking at the state and local level at what they can do in their own backyards and um, knowing that voting down ballot. And, and I think what I want, you know, part of what the film shows is their efforts paid off in having the, the largest youth voter turnout in uh, in a long time. So with the, the midterms and um, in our recent election, especially with black and brown communities, those kids in those swing cities, I think really got us the election pretty much. So I feel the hope is looking toward 22 and the film is as much about a youth movement and youth engagement as it is about guns. Yeah. Well, if you're watching this and you'd like to see the documentary is available both in theaters and on demand. By the time this is posted, it'll be available nationally. So definitely take a look at that. And both David and Kim, we appreciate you taking time out of what's gotta be a very busy day. Join us, we appreciate you and your work. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.